Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world, and welcome to today's webinar on why working at the office will never be the same again. Did the old office environment deliver the best way of working? Has working from home delivered unique, unexpected, positive benefits? Have we discovered new techniques, rhythms, and routines we want to maintain? Are there things about being back in the office that we're relishing and things we didn't even realize we missed? Sophie Hutchison, non-executive director at Bell Capital UK, will explore some of the changes associated with people returning to the office and the impacts of a hybrid working environment, while suggesting some questions that leaders and employees can ask themselves to assist with effectively adapting to this new world and some practical steps we can take to maximise the benefits and opportunities these changes bring and how we might mitigate against unwanted consequences. Sophie originally qualified as an accountant and has enjoyed a diverse and successful career over the past 30 years in a variety of roles across financial services, including as a regulator, risk manager, a bank CEO, COO and chief of staff. Her impressive resume includes working with Lehman Brothers, Deutsche Bank and Wells Fargo. Most recently, she's begun her non-executive career, advising leadership teams and boards, putting her passion for effective and practical operating models that ensure teams develop to their full potential to good use. So before I hand over Sophie to Sophie to impart some of her wisdom this morning, I have some brief housekeeping points for those who are new to our webinars. I'm Charlotte Dorbrashley and I manage the FS Club here at ZN and I'd like to warmly acknowledge our very generous sponsors who enable us to continue to bring you a wide range of thought-provoking content across finance, technology and economics. And I'm indeed coming to you from an office in the city today but I do enjoy the benefits of a hybrid working model and I'm keen to learn more about your experiences and preferences and I know Sophie is too. The slides to this presentation will be publicly available on our website and in the chat box. The session will be recorded and available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And we'll also be holding a 20 minute Q&A after Sophie's presentation. So please use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me and then I'll feed them into the conversation. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Sophie. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Good morning, everybody. Um, so before we dive into the topic, let me just very quickly add my introduction of myself and what I stand for. So I'm Sophie Hutchison, 30 odd years working in financial services in lots of different roles. But who am I? Well, I have no claims to be an academic with bundles of research papers behind me. Rather, I am a practical, experienced leader and a doer. Um, I'm passionate about ensuring that the operating model of an organisation, whether it is a profit or non-profit driven organisation enables the workforce to deliver on strategy and to develop the teams to their full potential so that they're happy in their work. And we need to tailor practical and easy to implement solutions. So that's what I'm about. Could we have the next slide please. So what I would like to explore with you today is why working at the office will never be the same again. And importantly, some of the changes that have emerged since people have been working at home, returning to the office, and the impacts of this hybrid environment. Did that old office environment deliver the best way of working? Well, I don't know if any of you um, can recognize the person sitting in that, that office. Look at all the paper, look at the clipboard, look at the phone. That was the old office. Um, or we've got our modern office on our desks in our spare room, if we've got a spare room, but more of that later. I'd like to consider some questions that leaders and employees can ask themselves while adapting to this new world of hybrid working and discuss how practically to maximise some of the benefits and the opportunities and how we might address unwanted impact. So just before we get going, there's a couple of questions that we'd like to ask you as the audience, just to try and um, rustle up some feedback straight away. So I'll hand over to, to Charlotte. What is the preference, what is your preference now that many of us are operating in a hybrid working environment? Do you prefer working at home? Do you prefer the hybrid? Or do you prefer to be office based? Thanks, Sophie. We'll just give um, 30 seconds or so for everyone to answer that one. They're usually um, pretty fast. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Yeah, so 70, 76% prefer um, the hybrid model, 0% office space. Wow, um, pretty clear there. 24% uh, prefer working from home. Okay, and then we've got another question. Well, another couple of questions. Has your organisation set out its expectations for this new world of work? Yeah, a simple one here, yes or no. So this one should be relatively fast. 58% mm -hmm. have and 42% haven't. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then are you happy with those expectations? Yes or no? Um, I guess that sort of leads into if whether they're happy working from home or not, or being in the office, depending on what those expectations are. Oh, but overwhelmingly, 70% are happy with them and 30% aren't. Good. Excellent. So let's get going. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So to start with, I would like to pick up on some themes that a previous ZN speaker looked at back in April 2021, so nearly 18 months ago. Her name was Melissa Fisher, or is Melissa Fisher. She's a renowned cultural anthropologist, and she talked about navigating the new physical and digital workplace during the pandemic. At that time, we obviously were still in the middle of the pandemic and had become somewhat used to working from home. She looked at what hybrid workplaces would feel and look like, how they might need to be re-engineered, how will employees navigate them, and what are the impacts on their career experiences and the opportunities for development. And if you missed that webinar, I would recommend it. It's still very relevant, and it's a really good way of getting into the thinking about your own work environment. I wonder how many organisations have actually considered an anthropologist approach to looking at their workplace, looking at their people, looking at the structure to help them plan for the future. And I stress I'm not an anthropologist, but I have spent a good amount of time over the last 15 years focusing on how to adapt organisations to get the most out of people or to flip it round, how to support individuals and teams to develop and reach their full and happy potential and I stress the happy. Interestingly, one of the polls during Melissa's talk showed that the majority, 69%, thought that building an inclusive culture everywhere was the most important work cultural shift to tackle. Um, and that's something that we, we will focus on today. I strongly believe that organizations need a balance between the delivery of their strategy and the needs of employees. You might say this is obvious, that it's a no-brainer, but with ever-increasing costs, organisations need to cut their cloth to their means. Equally, individuals are increasingly focusing on the cost of living increases, financial stability threats, and job security worries. So for me, the ideal hybrid working environment needs to be safe, comfortable and meeting the varying financial and non-financial needs of employees, making sure that it enables but doesn't hinder the best performance levels. But I think the ZN community is up for this challenge. Before we get bogged down or too bogged down in the tough stuff, I want to quickly reflect on some of the themes that I've observed during the disruptions of the last couple of years, some of which we want to hang on to in the new hybrid world of work, and some that have definitely frustrated us and need addressing. I've seen many positives emerging during the pandemic, both office-based and working from home. Um, more time with families, fewer disturbances, more spontaneous meetings set up, reduced travel time, reduced costs of travel, meals, clothes, environmental benefits, more time for hobbies, New social networks outside of work, you might have got to know your neighbours better, more local to home. We became kinder to people outside our family groups. How somehow I think we need to try and hang on to that. But on balance, it's not been great for all the workforce. During lockdowns, I know there are a lot of people felt very isolated, people who lived alone or far from their family. 
was an increased pressure on carers during lockdown. How do you juggle children, caring demands and work? Sometimes that's extended the working day into the evenings. Lack of space at home, leading to both mental as well as physical health issues. Lots of more bad backs. Harder to engage with colleagues. Harder to gain access to the development resources. Harder to build networks and relationships. Harder to supervise the performance of teams for some people and an expectation hanging over people that you're always available. An example of this might be the ballooning of meeting invites online. Oh, we'll just invite everyone in the department. Will it jam up people's diaries? So at a macro level, the experiences of the last few years have taught us that a number of areas need attention. There's an increased awareness, visibility, and now more di regular dialogue across society as a whole around the issues of race, gender, and class. There's a need for more social inclusivity. We've got changing priorities from the workforce. The importance of balance between work and life has come to the fore. People want more flexibility in when and where their work can be done. There's a lot more environmental concerns. Most recently, the cost of living and financial security for some individuals have really come to the fore. And questions are being asked of organisations and people about what they are willing to trade off. For me, as a manager and a leader, what emerged was a creeping sense of disconnection from my colleagues and from the teams. It was much harder to coach, much harder to mentor when the body language was less visible on a screen. The lack of opportunity to actually enjoy work together. The increasing silence of junior colleagues during 2021 when we had group calls and meetings, those that had been quite engaged and vociferous at the beginning of the pandemic had suddenly seemed to go very silent. And I started to question, well, what was causing this and what are the long-term impacts? So how can we reverse some of these unwanted changes? And I mean we. This is not something that one person, however senior in an organisation, can do alone. And my first question to everybody, and you don't have to answer this one, does it have to be a trade-off? Ask yourselves that question. Let's have the next slide, please. I'm sure that many of you are working in organisations which are pushing out approaches and policies on how they want to um, the hybrid environment to operate. What did we say? 58% have, have had some kind of communication and there's an approach that's being um, put forward. I start from the view that work should be human centric. It's obvious, but it's worth reiterating. And if we're going to assess what interventions are needed, there are different specialists who can support us. The physical place where we work impacts much of life, not just the working hours. Is the office layout optimal, safe, secure? Is there support for an ergonomic home office? Is there space at home to separate home and work? Home working wasn't new, just the scale of it. Do we need adaptations now where people are part in the office and part out of the office? The structure of work, do we need to look at the operating model, the tasks, the processes, the organisation model, teams? We need to focus on rebuilding the team and rebuilding relationships, assessing if the working practices are still optimal to performance, or maybe they need to be tweaked. And for me, wellness is a very important piece of this, the human and the emotional needs. It's really important to recognise them, articulate the challenges, and that some people are still suffering. Those with long COVID, those who have still got anxiety, people who are still feeling isolated. And also to consider the social wellness of the group and not just the individual. So depending on your management's experience and skills, you might consider the, looking for the support of process engineers, organizational anthropologists, psychologists, or maybe you've got these in-house, 
maybe some of them can be provided by HR specialists in your organisation. Next slide, please. So, while we can touch on some of those macro approaches, I want to focus in on a few areas which we as individuals, both managers and as managed, can act upon and how we might do that. Specifically, some of the tough things to overcome, I think, are to include, or tough things include, acknowledging the obstacles and the need to try out things, evolve, adapt. We need to look at relationship building and rebuilding. We need to focus on visibility and trust. We need to sell the change to our fatigued workforce. We're all pretty fatigued. And we need to look at working practices and tools and techniques. And we need to think about development and learning. And my next couple of slides um, are going to talk about those six areas in a little bit more detail and give some sort of practical thought to what we, how we might address those. So let's get that Rubik's Cube going and let's go to the next slide, please. So running through a range of starter ideas, and accepting that there are many, many competing demands on everyone's resources right now. So I wouldn't advocate trying them all. Um, I want to start with acknowledging the obstacles and the need to try things out, evolve and adapt. I think it's really important when you're with your colleagues, either as a manager or a leader or just with a colleague, to, talk, to start to understand and talk about the phases of moving to the hybrid environment. Where are you now? In terms of are you, you're immediately back in the office, well, you've sort of done that, you've got there. Um, are you in that intermediate stage or have you still got quite a long way to go into the future until you've got the hybrid working model working okay? Acknowledging that we're all learning. This is a new world and our immediate environment will continue to evolve and change and that may be unsettling and uncomfortable for some people. But reinforce the message we have achieved so much over the last two or three years and we should have a strong belief in ourselves humans are pretty resilient and pretty re adaptable um, and much as we might like to have stability and no change we can cope with it don't be afraid to talk about approaches that you tried that didn't work as well as those that are successful i think as a as a manager as a leader i learned a, a while ago to tell those stories about things that you did that, that tried but they didn't really work and you got the feedback and you decided to shelve them it actually shows some humility and it shows a realistic view um, always always telling the positive stories all the time does does have a tendency to wind some people up thinking about the relationships um, building and rebuilding um, I would suggest that organizations remind and train their leaders and their managers to spend a bit of time making sure they are listening and coaching and developing their teams it's really important to reinforce that now perhaps it's five minutes at the start of each team meeting so that you can air the challenges or the successes of the new working environment encouraging the casual interactions um, something that uh, we did in one of my organizations in the past pre-pandemic was we introduced this online matching of people to go and have a coffee and connect with people so it was completely random you got matched up with somebody else in the organization and the idea was basically to help build networks find out about what was going on in other parts of the organization learn what other departments do um, creating opportunities for spontaneous interaction so when people are back in the office, managers actually setting time aside to walk the floor and go and informally interact and have a chat. Doesn't necessarily have to be about work, it could be about anything, but actually just starting to build that back into the normal behavior in the office. Making spaces physically within the office, so that, and in, really encouraging people to use their meal times and their breaks, get away from their desk. Um, you could you could make this hybrid. You can invite people to have a coffee together, even if they're in different places. It might feel very odd to begin with, but once you get used to it, it, it might become quite quite normal again. 
mentoring and buddying programs let's re-enliven those it doesn't have to just be one-to-one -one mentoring or one-to-one -one buddying it could be groups not just individuals I ran a bunch of um, career development mentoring programs um, in one of my previous roles where we had groups of five or six people who got together once every couple of months with a couple of mentors who were from a, a grade of, you know, slightly more senior than them. Um, and they worked really effectively. So they got to talk about things that were bothering them about their workspace, whatever it was. And, and it really worked. And, and Fed, they fed off each other and then finally engaging informal networks and consider champions to help so have you got the networks that used to exist before everybody went to work from home family networks women's networks lgbt networks whatever they are can you actually re-enliven and reinvigorate those and use them to actually start rebuilding that that feeling of belonging if we think about visibility and trust, um, I'm sure that a lot of organisations that you're in, there's been leaders and managers holding panels, town halls, dial in, Zoom calls, where people can dial in and listen to the sort of more formal messaging. Those obviously need to be adapted to your organisation, and one size doesn't necessarily fit all. For managers who are not necessarily at the top of the organisation, you know, can you hold group sessions which are not necessarily your weekly team meeting, but a group session that actually talks about how everybody's getting on in this new hybrid environment? Do you have places for staff to raise questions about the workplace? Perhaps anonymously, perhaps not. So focus groups, um, a hotline. And I would suggest dedicating somebody to collate the questions go get the answers, whether that's taking it to one individual in management or whether it's actually um, a, a, a group of people that need to agree to the response and then making sure that those get published and that it becomes something that is regular, that people can then see that there is a two-way dialogue going on. That's gonna build the trust back between the organization, with the, all of the audience, all of the people within the organization and, and the leadership. Um, encouraging ideas and solutions from staff and where these are adopted, giving some really good recognition. And leaders, um, tell stories. Tell stories, your personal stories about your experiences. Be honest, waltz and all. Um, it's amazing how, how that can really help to build the visibility and the trust. If we go on to the next slide then, um, just a few more tips. So how are we going to sell this change to a fatigued workforce? I've talked a little bit about celebrating. Celebrate the successes of the last three years. If performance has been good, let's talk about it. Personal successes, charitable social events, new joiners. Who are, you know, how many new joiners have we had and managed to induct? How many new children has the organisation had? How many marriages? But also it's important to remember those that were lost during the pandemic. Create that cultural dialogue. We talked a little bit about feedback routes, so having focus groups and, and hotlines, but having a choreographed session perhaps to coach out, coach out thoughts and ideas, ask staff what they feel unsure about or are uncomfortable with, what do they miss? How, do they, how can we have some fun in the workplace? Um, continual checkups, check-ins and feedback, important. I think it's important to keep an open mind and don't be afraid to course correct um, and admit that. Engaging younger cohorts, new joiners for ideas, perhaps people coming into the organisation have seen something that works in a previous organisation. And a brave organisation might like to develop um, some new work rituals, some new social rituals. You know, is there a Friday event that's run? Is there a first of the month event that's run? That also can engender more belonging. Working practices and tools, um, we need definitely are going to need to flex the approach for different cohorts. Less experienced new joiners or departments, one size doesn't have to fit all. 
you might want to consider a mini operating model as you look at what, why and how different parts of the organisation operate. Involve the people in the workforce. What have they changed? What, have, what should we keep of what they've changed and what do we want to chuck? What's missing? What are the frustrations, the blind spots, the tensions, the delays? Showing that you're unafraid to actually hear the issues means you're halfway there to solving some of them. Time management was one that uh, I thought might be worth a, a refresher course on. Help people to move from the pandemic crisis mindset back into a more normal reality. Resetting the boundaries of work and home time. Releasing more time. Does everybody need to be on the same phone call? Or can you actually have a fewer number of attendees and pass the information back in a, in a different format? Keep the inclusivity and the co collaboration as strong tenets of any new practices that you develop um, to reinforce that sense of belonging. And what does it mean to be a manager now? Reinforce, it's not just about supervising the tasks. It's about creating lines of sight between activity and the strategy of the organisation and its delivery. Becoming the storyteller takes practice but increases the sense of belonging and understanding and the appreciation of each and everybody's contribution. Development and learning. I think there's obviously a mixture here. Formal sessions that are in person and online simultaneously. Focus on soft skills. Our junior cohorts have missed over two years chance opportunity to watch how others run meetings, how they behave in the office, how they influence decisions. That, I think, has been my biggest worry and why a lot of people have become very silent. Informal get to know the organisation sessions. Get them to be led by a team or a department head. But don't make it all about them. Poll the organisation for other topics of interest. Are they interested in environmental issues? Demystification of recent scientific or technological developments? and really encourage this pay on mentality. We all became kinder to non-family relations. How do we hang on to that? And what are the broader benefits of it? Next slide, please. So in conclusion, it's still early days. We won't get it right immediately. Look at Tesla, Apple, and some of the tech giants who've been in the news recently with their return to work policies. What we can predict is that other variables will emerge to influence whether and how we spend our three days a week in the office, or is it really only one and a half days? Will the huge increases in fuel costs push more people to go into the office in winter to save on their heating bills at home? Will cycling to work become more attractive? Will we see demands from our younger cohorts for more opportunity to learn by watching, which they've sorely missed out on? I know we're about to move to Q&A, but I invite the audience to share thoughts and also ideas that you're trying out with the group, both successful ones and those to avoid. I truly believe that these real life stories are very, very useful in uncovering blind spots and unintended consequences. Thank you. I'll hand back to Charlotte now. Thank you very much um, for that informative and interesting presentation, Sophie. There um, were a lot of useful and practical takeaways there. Um, as Sophie said, please do keep sending in your questions and experiences using the chat facility. Um, here, here at ZN, we've had, we have a couple of rituals that we adopted during COVID that we still um, regularly do, which I think help a lot. And one of those things that I particularly miss during the um, lockdown was just those informal chats with colleagues that are not about work, how was your weekend, sort of, you know, the water cooler chats, as you call them. And so now twice a week we have um, in Teams, it's a 15 minute water cooler chat, whoever's free logs in and the only rule is you can't talk about work. So it'll be different people each time, just quick chat with your colleagues um, and that's really, really enjoyable and a good way to get to know people. And I think when I, um, joined about a year ago it was you know a good few months before I met people in person so that was very um, very helpful um, and it looks like we do have a couple of um, questions and other experiences in here um, so Peter Bunker has asked besides the likes of T 
Teams, Zoom, GTM, and VDI. Um, how are businesses utilizing technology to create better working environments and deploying the hybrid workplace model? Gosh, that that's a real good question. And and actually, if, if other people have got ideas, please stick that stick them on the chat. Um, so so I think. Um, if I think about some of the organizations that I know of, um, Wells Fargo, when I was there, during, um, during the sort of the latter part of the pandemic, was starting to run charitable um, events. So it wasn't really technology, but it was charitable events where they were getting everybody to go out, and this was their Dublin-based bank, to go out and jump in the sea together um, and actually get to know each other that way. Um, in terms of technology development, I mean, we've heard about all these online scratch boards and post-it notes and, and, and all of that kind of thing. I must admit, I, I found those quite difficult to use myself. And you do need an awful lot of screens to be able to do that. There's, there's nothing better than a piece of paper to doodle on. Um, but I think, um, you know, having shared technology drives, having those kind of technology can be very very useful but also i think you know we spent i spent a lot of time working on presentations working on um, documentation and somehow going back to the version controls that we all learned about and maybe lawyers learned about accountants learned about policy makers learned about and actually refreshing people's techniques at using those i think they were actually quite important because that way you could read a document quietly on your own in your back room. You could put all your comments in. You could then send it back to the group and then you could get other people's comments. So you had a really good record of the comments and the thoughts and the ideas that you'd maybe gone through, the ones you discarded, the ones that you kept. Um, and actually, in some ways, that was a better record than when you all used to sit in the office and just chat about it, you'd all agree, oh, well, those five ideas were a daft idea, forget them. But nobody ever wrote down that you'd actually talked through them and decided to chuck them away. Um, so so I, I don't know whether that actually helps. Are there any ideas that people have stuck in the chat room? Um, I see here Andrew um, Sinclair has mentioned the um, coffee roulette idea that you spoke about. Um, randomly yeah. allocating people to meet for coffee and um, he said it's been excellent um, for them and there that's reminded him actually to organize another one um, yeah. and then John um, Knights has said um, he's not sure many senior leaders have the uh, personality and emotional intelligence to actually accept that um, happiness is an important goal um, you know I, you know I think he's obviously referring to a lot some people are promoted on their technical expertise as opposed to their um, EQ. So he's asking, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with it? Um, so if I try and put myself back into the, the mindset of someone who's, who's in the middle of the organization and you've got managers who don't think happiness is important. Um, if you're in an organization which is brave enough to have some culture sessions whether it's focus groups or not um, i would suggest you make or, or you have an organization that has a hotline or a place that you can put ideas in is to try and suggest that the organization runs some focus groups that they run some cultural discussion groups and put that in as a topic as a subject which can be discussed you know, put, phrase it perhaps as a question that could be get a get an anthropologist in, get a psychologist in. Could we hear from someone around what makes people want to go to work, and and ask and phrase it in the terms of questions. Um, I was I can remember when I was at Lehman Brothers a long time ago, one of the really senior guys who ran about a third of the organization standing up in front of a whole group of people in the auditorium and saying, I know what it's like to be unhappy at work and I didn't do a terribly good job for three years. And I learned that as as a as a young person, as a young manager, and so I left that job and moved. 
Um, and he, re he had remembered that and he spoke about it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's very true. And I think pre-pandemic, there was quite a lot of focus on mental health in, in the workplace. I am sure that there are certain people in every organization who will understand that if people are not happy, they're never going to meet their full potential. In the same way as if they're scared or frightened, they're not going to be able to do a good job. If they feel overwhelmed, they're not going to be a do, a, able to do a good job. But I think I, I, I sort of hear the, the reticence of, well, what do I do if the boss I've got doesn't think that way? Um, are you brave enough to actually challenge that individual and say, um, how do we make the team, how do we get the team to be happier? Because I think that might actually get them to be more, you know, perform better. Or maybe you have to do it by a slightly more indirect route. Um, there probably are a number of different ways you can get there. Um, maybe that's giving some food for thought. But happy to, um, I think it's John, happy to have a, an offline conversation if, if he wants to do that. Yeah, John's also um, said that his suggestion would be that HR selection policies are drastically changed so we get the um, right kind of leaders. Is that um, something that you would agree with? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. You know, HR policy, we should, we should uh, employ leaders and, and, and promote people. Of course, we should only promote people who've got an EQ as well as an IQ that's reasonably well developed. But if you want immediate solutions, um, sometimes, sometimes that's, uh, having a policy doesn't always make it reality. Um, and, and I think this is, this is one of the things that messages that we get across is we don't have to wait for the guy at the top, the person who's at the top of each department to do some of this stuff. Some of it, yeah, you do need them to take the lead. But sometimes it's about actually suggesting something to them. And I can tell you as a, as a manager and as a leader, when, when people in my teams came to me and said, I really, I really think we need to focus on X. Um, you know, we don't, we don't know what the people in the department who sit next door to us actually do. We've got no idea. We see them in the toilets, we see them in the kitchen. Uh, well, imagine what it's like when you're not even in the same building together. You never even bump into them. We want to know what they do. We want to understand what another department actually does. We send them a report every month, but we never get anything feedback back. If you had an organization that understood what all the other departments did better, I guarantee you, you'd have a more, um, a, a better performing organization because people would, would spot the blind spots. Um, and um, so last question, um, we've seen a bit in the media lately about firms who have chosen to give, if employees don't want to come into the office, they've, um, they'll be give, given basically a salary cut and those who do come in can maintain this current salary and I know some firms are doing it by about 20%. Um, what, is your, what is your thoughts on that? Oh, I think um, that my personal thoughts, I think it's quite a drastic step. Um, I think it sends an incredibly negative message. Um, I think it's going to create silos. Um, I think if they really wanted to do that, there's probably a slightly more subtle way of doing it. Um, maybe with all of the inflation increases in costs and all that kind of stuff, maybe they encourage people to come into the office more by helping with travel costs or something like that. Um, but I think to, tr to sort of create that two tier um, tranches across your workforce, um, it's a little bit like 10 plus years ago when organisations were outsourcing or were moving roles from, say, London to other parts of the UK or to abroad um, and saying to people, well, you're going to get made redundant in London unless you move to Manchester or Birmingham or wherever it was. Oh, but by the way, you, you're going to go into a different pay structure. Um, big surprise, most people didn't want to move. Um, because it is, it's really important, and particularly in the current environment. Um, I, I think it's a really, personally, I think it's a really, really dangerous move. Um, and, and a sad reflection on, on organisations that they can't find, if they need to save costs, um, then maybe they need to 
looking look at different opportunities, different alternatives. Yeah, definitely yeah. creates a bit of a um, two-tier workforce, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Great. So, um, do you have any final comments to wrap things up, um, Sophie, yeah. before we close? Yes. So, my final message, um, keep experimenting to evolve. Listen to the feedback and the needs of all of the different groups within your organisation. Some will be vociferous. Some will be polarised. Uh, most will be fatigued with change and disruption, um, but don't give up, keep practicing. Um, and a share, just my last thought, a tip from a psychologist that I got recently, don't respond to emotional reactions with logic. It doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a good point. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. And once again, thanks to our wonderful sponsors for making these webinars possible. And equally important, thank you to you, um, our audience, for your time and contributions today. Don't forget to check out our forthcoming events tab on our website with some stimulating topics coming up from the EU's sustainable finance regulations to organise crime targets in the City of London. You can even join a webinar from your smartphone or listen on your podcast app of choice. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.